Hello everyone, Daim Shabazz here of The Chess Drum and today I'm going to present to you a commemoration for Black History Month. The month of February is the month that we commemorate and celebrate the accomplishments of uh, people of African descent, most specifically African Americans in the society. And Black History Month has evolved over a period of time from its inception as Negro History Week. It was conceived by Dr. Carter G. Woodson. I will show you a picture of him, or pictures of him. This is Carter G. Woodson, who was an educator and born in 1875, right after the Emancipation Proclamation. And this was a very critical time for black people. Now, he happened to have had the uh, benefit of higher education. So this Black History Month wasn't just something that was conceived by somebody who was a radical and running around and with his fist up and afro no, this was something that started in 1926, this idea that a segment of society is, in his words, being ignored and not being given its, its proper recognition for the accomplishments that uh, it has made uh, in society. And so he wanted to bring uh, shed light on that. Now. There are many other articles uh, about Carter G. Woodson, and this is from Britannica.com, and it gives his um, name, his full name. The G is Sir Godwin, and he was born in Virginia, died in Washington, D.C., where he was a longtime resident, and he was on the faculty and a dean at Howard University, known as the father of black history. So he actually graduated from Barrera College in Kentucky, where he got his bachelor's in 1903. So wrap your head around that, 1903. And we're talking about just less than 40 years after emancipation. Then University of Chicago, where he received a second bachelor's and a master's in 1908, then a PhD from Harvard University in 1912. And he was the second African-American uh, after W.E.B. Du Bois to get a Ph.D. from Harvard. W.E.B. Du Bois would then go on to be a faculty member at Atlanta University, which is actually my alma mater, um, later became Clark Atlanta University. But this history uh, is very important to understand uh, in, in terms of his drive and his ideas, which were also brought out in a book, classic book that he wrote called The Miseducation of the Negro. But his impetus for Black History Month was stated in uh, many, not only his book, but also uh, if you go online, you'll find many of his uh, comments. And so here it gives his history and he worked in coal mines in West Virginia and he was largely self-taught and he gives his academic history. He was uh, served on the faculty of Howard University and eventually as the Dean of Arts and Sciences. But he says here that Woodson believed that the white dominated historical profession had little interest in black history. He saw African-American contributions overlooked, ignored, and even suppressed by writers of history books and the teachers who use them. So that was his main impetus for creating an idea where these, these types of accomplishments can um, bring, be brought to light. And he created a uh, Journal of Negro History, which later became the, germ the Journal of African American History. And then Black History Month, then becoming uh, into being evolving uh, from Negro History Week to Black History Month in 
1976. He died in 1950 at age 74. So that was Carter G. Woodson. And again, not just a run-of-the-mill person. This was someone who was well-educated. He was a scholar. He was published. He thought about these issues. And he thought that it was indeed appropriate for uh, the recognition for black um, accomplishments or accomplishments from uh, people of African ancestry. It is interesting because these are the same questions that I faced because I did not have any information on black chess players. And when I conceived of the idea to have a publication to highlight these um, figures in chess, Initially, when I launched the Chess Drum in 2001, people wondered, why is there a need to do that? Um, and I'll be brutally frank, because there was no information. Where else would you find that information? You weren't going to find much of it on a consistent level in any national magazine. Nobody was writing uh, about it. And it... it came to me that once I started the chess drum, I started to find all of this information. And I'm thinking, well, why hadn't we seen it? Why hadn't we seen this information? Well, it's simply because nobody had the passion for it. And, and as Carter G. Woodson put it, it was, it was basically uh, ignored. And, um, and then the other piece is that when you do something like the chess drum, or something like it, you have to have a passion. And I have a obviously a vested interest in seeing this information come to light uh, because I know that in maybe generations to come, we'll look at this and they will derive some motivation and inspiration from it. And so it, it, it carries on a meaning that is beyond uh, what we see today. So with Black History Month, every year we have these commemorations. And last year, as I, I mentioned, from year to year I do different things. I even had uh, quizzes where I would have a list of Black History questions and you would have to answer it in a period of time. And then once the quiz closed, I would then give the answers and then award the winner a prize. So I did that for a few years. And that was uh, very, very fulfilling um, to see those who, weren't, who were not in the black community participating and winning prizes. Uh, and, and so I thought that was uh, very interesting for others to take an interest in it. Last year, I did a, commemor a daily commemoration where uh, if I scroll down and you'll, we'll go to February and you'll see that for each day I had a commemoration starting with the Paragon Chess Club, which most of you may not have heard of the Paragon Chess Club. Some of these other names you'll recognize if you follow the chess drum um, for any length of time, uh, you will know about some of these uh, individuals. Uh, the Paragon Chess Club, which was uh, based in Washington, D.C. And this story came about because I saw this photograph here, which I thought was very distinctive. You have these men who are well-dressed, who are very well-groomed, and are playing the game of chess. And these were men who obviously were very distinguished, very well-educated. Many were graduates of Howard University, uh, partaking in this uh, game of chess. The person who is seated on the right, I understand, was um, an expert-level player, about 2,000 ELO and was also um, working in um, the educational field, as was common in many of those days to have positions uh, in education as principals and as administrators. And so it was very important to provide these resources for uh, those who were seeking education because it was not available anywhere else because of the segregation laws. And so this um, was a very inspiring photograph for me and it was something that I wanted to make available to the Chess Drum audience. 
Looking at some of the others, Rogelio Ortega, Afro-Cuban, who was the 1966 Cuban champion and led Cuba on board one in the 1966 Olympiad. And there was an, a very interesting picture here that was sent to me by Jim Kobaki of Rogelio Ortega on the left playing Najib Bouaziz of Tunisia. And it just so happens that the first uh, African Grandmaster is from Tunisia, Slim Bouaziz. Is the first African grandmas. Of course, he is um, North African. He's Arab, uh, but um, obviously, all the North African uh, countries have a kind of a dual uh, dual loyalty with um, their Arab uh, brethren in the African continent. Uh, but here you have Rogelio Ortega playing um, Najib Bouaziz. And it just so happened that when I was in Cuba in 2011, I think it was, I went by the uh, Capablanca Chess Club or Club Capablanca in Havana. And while I was there, there was a memorial tournament being held in the name of Rojali Ortega. And so I thought it was just, it, it could not have been a coincidence that I was there during that time. This was something that was meant to happen. And so I was able to go there and take pictures and interact with the players, play some games. And uh, I, I was not in the tournament, but I was there um, and able to observe and take pictures. And so it was really a great, great um, uh, opportunity for me to show the um, to show where that that spirit came from. And some of the others um, you have um, come to know over the years, Theophilus Thompson, who was the problemist who wrote a book of problems, Morris Giles, Robert Guazé's Gold, The Moors of Spain. I enjoyed writing this one. Now, again, these were daily commemorations that I did last year. And this photo here was actually one that I used for an article that I wrote for chess.com. It's this one. And this was an article that was originally intended to be for Black History Month, but I wasn't able to complete it in time. And it came out March 28th, Chess Through an African Lens. This is one of the articles that I'm most proud of because I was able to run the gamut of just different issues as it pertained to chess in the African diaspora. And I highlighted James McCune Smith, who was actually a contemporary um, of some of the players um, that we know in history. And he talks about giving uh, his eyewitness account of watching Lewis Paulson and Paul Morphy play uh, during the first American Congress in 1857. And he talks about this this kind of appeal that chess has in times of economic turmoil that people can resort not to drugs, not to some other uh, activity to dull the senses, but to chess. And he says it in such an eloquent way. Uh, and he wrote this uh, brilliant essay titled Chess. Uh, and if you ever had, have a chance to read that essay, it is a, really um, a jewel. It um, has a lot of information about how chess was in the uh, mid-19th century. But this was an article that I did, and as you can see the, the uh, picture there, I used uh, of the Paragon Chess Club. Uh, and then one of the problems from Theophilus Thompson uh, that I call the Rook Romp where you have to figure out mate and 10. So, uh, and then you can play it out over the board. Uh, it's a rather uh, picturesque type of puzzle to solve. And it was done in his uh, book of problems. And all of the problems were white to play and mate. 
And Theophilus Thompson only lived to be 26. And um, there, there was a confusion because there were two Theophilus Thompsons, both in the Maryland area. And there was a thought that Theophilus Thompson had lived uh, into his 90s. But it turns out that that was another Theophilus Thompson who lived a, in a distance. And Theophilus Thompson, the chess player, died at age 26 from uh, tuberculosis. At that time, they, would, they called it uh, consumption. So that was last year. So go, go back and look through the archives and you'll find these, these uh, articles that I had uh, done um, daily and I ended on Emory Tate. Um, it just one other thing before I, I move on. With Michael Schleifer, who was international master from Canada, he passed away uh, some time ago. Uh, I did a, a tribute of him. And I received a, an email just yesterday from his sister. And I'll just, uh, I'll share it with you. And it says, Dear Daim Shabazz, I just wanted to take a moment to write you as this year's Black History Month comes to a close. I came across your remembrance of my brother Michael during February 2022's Black History Month, and your article brought me to tears. I thank you for remembering him. My family and I think of Michael every single day since his untimely passing, and it means it meant so much to me personally, to all of us, that you brought his contributions and his memory to the forefront after such time has passed. It is said that people, special people, live on through the memories of others who they have imprinted upon. Thank you for celebrating my brother, that you did so for the gift of his passion and profession. Chess is so meaningful to us. Thank you. Warmest, best, Jackie. It's his sister. So that was um, really a testament to what these commemorations uh, can do and what impact um, that they have. Uh, and there are lots of memories that, that we have of individuals and uh, we certainly want to hold on to those memories so they can serve as inspiration for others. I also did a, in 2020, I did an article for New in Chess called The Beat of the Chess Drum uh, after Dirk uh, Vanting Guzendam had been asking me for an article for years uh, and I finally was able to do this article and in it I recounted some of the history and how the chess drum started and, and then uh, I kind of did a walk through memory lane in terms of some of the, the people that were uh, involved. And I talked about um, some of the figures, Emory Tate being one, and I featured some games. And so that came out in 2020. And if you haven't seen that particular article, I did commemorate... Um, when you go to, actually, it's a, a 2020 article I did where I um, announced that the chess drum had done this article for New and Chess. In fact, if you go here on the website, you can actually find it under In the News. And these are articles so where chess drum was featured and so in this particular article you can go down all the way to the bottom in the comments and then you can find a link to the PDF file and you can read it um, I don't think New and Chess would have a problem with that being that it's it was so long ago so what do I have for you today? We're in already into the 20th minute, and so I don't want to take up too much more time. Uh, but I wanted to share with you a few things. Uh, firstly, 
I do have a book project that's ongoing. I'm, uh, when spring break is going to be here in a couple of weeks, I'll have a week to uh, do a few things, but I'm going to spend time working on this manuscript. I'm already 200 pages in, but these 200 pages were done two years ago when I was on sabbatical, and I haven't had a whole lot of time to, to spend on it. Um, but I have uh, quite a bit of information, and I think it would be make a very good contribution uh, for the prosperity of our history. And, you know, obviously the title is to be determined. I have a title here, but it's kind of as a placeholder. Um, when you write a book or even a chess article, Sometimes you don't have a title for it until after you finish because you may think of a title, but then over a period of time, especially for books, because books take a lot longer to take shape. You have all these chapters and it develops a life over time. And so once that book takes form, then it changes its character. By the time you reach the end of the book, then the title maybe the title that you thought of may not capture what that book is about. So you have to come up with another befitting title for the book. So I have a title as a placeholder and I have a cover, a book cover in mind that uh, I will probably show the chess drum community at some point. But yes, I have, uh, the book is going to be divided into parts and so far 15 chapters and I'll have appendices, I'll have best, a best game collection, I'll have puzzles. Uh, right now I have a hundred puzzles that I have, games I've selected. Um, I don't know if I'm going to have all 100 but I have a hundred that I've identified uh, and I just have a lot of information uh, in here that's going to be beneficial to the chess community uh, vintage pictures, some of which you've seen before. These are from the Wilbur Page Memorial and I have uh, found other uh, vintage photographs. I'm not sure if you can see that um, that picture but uh, yes I have uh, collected a lot of uh, a lot of pictures that I think will will be very appropriate for this um, this type of um, work whose time is um, has come and this project is long overdue so I'll give you more announcements about it as I make um, more progress you know about uh, with um, uh, with this project the first of five so this will be the first five I'll have five uh, books in the series and I will break it up into regions this is going to be North America uh, then I'll have books on the uh, Caribbean in South America, uh, Africa, and Europe, uh, and I will also, I'm thinking about having a book on uh, women, black women in chess, and then uh, I will leave you with um, kind of a autobiographical story about uh, my observations and my life in chess, because many people don't know. They don't know my background. They don't know uh, how I came to be, you know, in this uh, position and so yeah but that's definitely coming and hopefully by this time next year I will have um, done a release a book release a book launch and uh, be working on the, the second one so one of the things that I came across, now of course I have thousands and thousands of files, but I came across a particular video that brought back some memories and I will show it to you now. And you will probably say, wow, look at this person. I had not seen him like this in a long time and that is Maurice Ashley here at the HB Global chess challenge that he created in 2005 and he is given uh, here giving a 
and addressed uh, to the audience. It was a very, very successful tournament as far as uh, enjoyment is concerned. Now, it didn't meet the, the entry, the, the uh, entry, uh, entries for the tournament, but it was very successful. It was a $500,000 tournament. So here, Maurice is talking about the importance of chess and giving a bit of the history and then just talking about the importance uh, of chess as it pertains to its uh, characteristics and abilities to help shape the minds of the youth. Chess has been around for a long time, for over 1,500 years. It's global in its reach. It's reached all countries around the world, whether it started in Asia, down through Persia, northern Africa, into Europe, and eventually into the United States. And it's only fitting that a game with that kind of global reach should have a global tournament to celebrate it and that's what the HP Global Chess Challenge is all about. It is also a game that everyone plays, young and old, rich and not so rich, little boys and little girls, and it's also fitting that this event celebrates the youth, our young people who are our future. So that was Maurice in 2005 talking about the HP Global Chess Challenge. He would then go on to conceive of a concept tournament, a million, Millionaire Chess Open, which uh, I believe 2016 was the last one. But he had three tournaments starting in 2014 in Vegas and 2015 and then 2016 was in the Atlantic City in New Jersey. And, and so those tournaments ran their course and it was decided that they would not continue he had a partner in Amy Lee who helped um, put on the tournament and then actually she served as the investor uh, in the initiative. And so that that's also kind of one of those things in history that you kind of reflect on the possibilities and the fact that you have such a visionary trying to uh, promote chess in, in such a way. Some of the other things that when I think about history, you know, the history of black chess, I think about all of these points uh, in history, not only the in the 50s when you have Walter Harris, Frank Street, Leroy Muhammad, or Leroy Jackson then, uh, Kenneth Clayton, uh, Charles Covington, all of these people came along and they were in tournaments where there were not many blacks. And I've talked to, interviewed Walter Harris, and I've interviewed Frank Street and talked to them. And even Emory Tate would say, yeah, it gets lonely. You know, because you look around, you look at the hall, around the hall, and there are not many people of, there are not many black people who are playing. And we may ask the larger question, that why is that the case? Why don't you have such a groundswell of enthusiasm in the black community? Well, the black community plays chess, but perhaps the, the chess that we play is more on the casual level, playing quick chess, quick play, blitz chess, and because of the timing. Chess is, is very time intensive. It takes a lot of time, and if you're competing in tournaments, it takes a lot of time to prepare. It takes a lot of time to study and to get good. And if you are not seeking to get good and go up a level, then it becomes pointless to spend all that time and not to get the benefit uh, of raising your level. And so because it's so time intensive, and of course in our community, we tend to be uh, challenged, economically challenged, then you have to use your time in a way that's going to be, that's going to result in you getting a residual uh, a return on your investment of time. And chess has not been that. It, it, it simply has not been an avenue where you can earn a stable income. And I'm not talking about going and playing, you know, blitz on uh, in Times Square and playing somebody blitz 20 bucks a game and because that's not sustainable. And you have those who are in that space who like to hustle or who like to play chess for money in the parks. 
And that is a part, also a part of our history. But when we talk about chess excellence, you have to talk about players who have done, through, uh, done so through organized settings and through a tournament at environment and not just you know on the streets playing for dollars or you know playing in kind of shady areas and you know because that those those things again are part are parts of our history but there's more to chess than than just that side and i think we we tend to spend a lot of time focusing on quick play because that's all we have time for but there are players who are seeking uh, higher heights. Uh, recently, there's been uh, Black History. There's been um, Black History segments, uh, interviews done by Casa Corley, who now works as the head of community for Chess.com. He did three interviews. I think four interviews, and one is uh, maybe to come, but. Um, it would have to be today that he uh, does the last one. But this one here is a celebrating, titled Celebrating Black Excellence, an interview with Barrington Hardaway, who is just actually earned his second I Am Norm, which is another article that um, was done by uh, Anthony Levin. Now, Brewington is uh, obviously growing up um, to be quite a, a young man. Um, he has slimmed down. He was, uh, when he was younger, you know, he had a, uh, looked like he was going to, to be kind of a, um, um, have some weight on him, but he's, he's now very slender and earned his second I am norm and he's um, uh, moving on. But as you can see that there were other articles celebrating black excellence. Now, some people took offense to this because they're thinking that because you're celebrating black excellence, that must be a negative thing because chess has no color, kumbaya, everybody's together, and we shouldn't celebrate someone based upon the color of their skin. And these are the types of simplistic comments that often come out. Now, in chess, we have a very diverse community. We have people of all ages. We have people of all ethnicities, all nationalities. We have, obviously, there's a push to get more women, more females uh, to play chess. Uh, we have chess for uh, disabled. We have chess specifically for people who are incarcerated. We have all types of segments in our chess community. And those are embraced. Those those are widely embraced. You know, chess for women, girls and women, that's the thing now. That you want more girls and women to play chess. Now, is that negative because we're focusing on girls and women? Of course not. It shouldn't be. And we should embrace all the differences in our community. And we should embrace differences in humanity. 
there's no such thing as saying we're all the same and there are no differences and we, you know, we're all a human race. No, we're different. And we have to recognize that there are differences and we should celebrate those differences because then from that we can learn more about aspects of our community. And then also we can enrich ourselves if we learn about the experiences of others. The idea that we just are in some colorblind world and nothing matters, nationality doesn't matter, and race doesn't matter, uh, I think has been one of the most egregious mistakes that we make when we look at the race problem, when we look at issues of uh, racial uh, animus in society, and we try to ignore it and say it doesn't exist and we're all alike. Looking at um, these issues and celebrating perhaps you know a, a particular ethnicity is something that we should embrace because it shows that chess is accessible it shows that chess is widespread it shows that chess can be an inspiration it shows it shows that chess is universal and so with these things it would behoove us to look at the celebration of different segments of the community and me being in the position that I am for the last 22 years, writing thousands of articles about figures in black chess, uh, I would like to think and looking at my metrics, I would like to think that the information that I have provided over the time has inspired those who are not part of the, the African diaspora. Because if you like chess, then you should like the chess drum. It shouldn't matter that I'm focusing primarily on players of African descent because chess is being featured. And if you like chess, then you should like the stories that I'm presenting. Um, one other thing that I'd like to talk about is the future. Where, where does the, what does the future hold for chess in the black community? in the African diaspora. I have given interviews here and there and I'm really asked this question. Where, where is black chess and where does it go? I was recently chatting with uh, Maurice Ashley and um, uh, as you may know, Maurice Ashley has decided to move away from commentating and he has announced that he's going to focus more on developing content and he's going to, he has a book project that he's finishing up and he's going to do some other things. And I said to him that I've known Maurice since 1989 and there's a story for that as well. But I told him that there, there needs to be some collaborative effort between the two of us because I mean, we've been, we, back in 1990 in the summer, I was in New York and we were had these phone conversations and we were kind of envisioning the world of chess through our own lens. And it would just so happen that I would go on a course of journalism and he would go on a course of commentary. And it, um, it, it looking back at that and, and looking at that time in 1989, 1990, that was a very important time because it created in our minds a higher purpose that we were going to play a role in the chess community that was going to be bigger than us. And so we're looking at perhaps some type of collaborative effort and uh, I don't know what that will be, but um, I think that there is, is also room for expansion uh, there is also room for recognizing people who are in the community who may not have gotten recognition. Uh, I can name a number of people. I won't begin naming names because then I might forget some and you might say, well, why didn't you mention me? Because I'm doing X, Y, and Z in this particular city. I'm doing ABC in this city. But let's just say that during the 22 years of the chess drum, I have try to provide inspiration and particularly for those who are coming up the uh, when we talk about the Tani Adewumi um, 
the Bruin Hart, Hart, uh, Hardaway, and before them, Justice William, Josh Colas, James Black, and before them, Casa Corley. I was trying to provide a platform for their motivation and for them to be inspired to move forward. And also to give them good, good um, indexing on the internet. So when you punch something in the internet, th their name, an article will come up that is going to be championing their, their praises. I have done also the same thing with uh, certain players uh, such as Darian Robinson, Rochelle Ballantyne, and all of these players who show talent. Uh, because it is with that that you're going to develop some kind of sustainability in the community of not only chess players, because all of us don't have to play chess. We can be journalists, we can be directors, we can be organizers, we can be coaches and trainers. There are so many things that we can do in chess. But I think there has to be some type of uh, motivation that comes there have to be some type of inclusion, which unfortunately, up until this point, we have not seen much um, in, in, in terms of outreach. When you talk about outreach to specific segments of the community, this is done by many businesses who have decided in target, target marketing, where they look at segments and they segment by different demographics. They segment by age, they segment by race. They segment by gender, by income, by education. These are all segments. And so this is what chess is. Chess is a sum of its um, parts. And the black community is one of those parts. And it is um, very important that we do honor this particular segment of our community so that we can actually tap a new market of chess players. We represent such a small amount of chess players, relatively speaking, that it seems to me that we have uh, not tapped, fully tapped the market for chess players. And hopefully uh, in the future, we will see more efforts being made and more outreach being made by the chess community to reach the uh, African-American community so we can have more of these success stories uh, that uh, we have seen over the past 22 years. So that's all I'm going to bring to you today in this last day of Black History Month. Hopefully you have enjoyed uh, this time that I've spent with you. Um, keep on playing, keep on making contributions to chess. Um, and uh, obviously, I want to be able to have things to, to write about. And so for all of you out there in the Chess Drum audience, thanks for your support. And as I always say, keep the beat going. Thank you.